All right, so October 26th, talking about uh, concavity and the second derivative test. So concavity is if something curves up or down. So this whole thing is concave up. This whole thing is concave down. This part of the graph is concave down until we get to here, and then it changes to concave up. When we have a change in concavity and we are continuous, that's called a point of inflection. We can also get changes in concavity with an asymptote, but if we have a change in concavity with an asymptote, that's not a point of inflection. A point is an actual point that exists. So it's that dot right there. Um, if we look at slopes, uh, we can slopes can tell us something about concavity as well. So if you think about the slope of this line versus the slope of this line versus the slope maybe of this line, you can see that those slopes are increasing. So maybe this was a negative 5 slope, and maybe this is a negative... Uh, negative two-thirds slope, and maybe this is a, uh, I don't know, um, one-fourth slope. So you can see those slopes are increasing So on something that's concave up. Um, it's very important to be able to go from one graph to another. So if we start with this function f, and we have f prime right here, we're supposed to know that if the derivative is positive, the function is increasing. So I have that indicated here on blue. So positive derivative. Now today we're going to learn that the second derivative of f tells us whether it's concave up or concave down. So if the second derivative is negative, then the original function is concave down. But we still need to be able to connect these, so that's why I called this g. So if I call the first derivative g, then its derivative would be g prime. So I can look at it kind of like uh, position, velocity, and acceleration. Acceleration is the second derivative of position, but acceleration is the first derivative of velocity. And so we need to be able to move backwards and forwards through these three different situations and know what they tell us about each other. Okay, so what happens to the derivative of a concave up function as we move from left to right? So that's what I was looking at here, and we just said that's increasing. The derivative, the slope, is increasing. Okay, and f prime is increasing when its derivative is positive. So that's when f double prime is greater than zero. So that's where we can connect those different things. So our test for concavity is f is concave up because, I, used to, I should emphasize that on increasing and decreasing. I would say because, because people forget to write the reason. Why? Why is it concave up? Why is it concave down? That's the calculus part right there. That's the most important part is the because. That's why I haven't capitalized it. That's supposed to emphasize because, and it's concave down if the second derivative, f double prime of x, is less than zero. That should be easy to remember. Up, positive, down, negative. Same as slope. Same as increasing and decreasing. They go together. All right? Points of inflection. So the key here is that a point of inflection is a point. Okay? And I just kind of repeated that up there. Where the concavity changes, where a graph crosses its tangent line. A tangent line must exist at that point to have a point of tangency. Point of inflection. Point of inflection. Okay. In order for there to be a point of inflection, the graph uh, has to have a second derivative equal to zero, or it has to be not differentiable at C. It is possible to have a second derivative equal to zero, but not have a point of inflection, because that happens at asymptotes also. So it's very important for a point of inflection to check back to the original and see if it's defined. Okay, so that's just a bunch of uh, explanation. Let's actually look at an example of something that we have to do. Okay, so 
Determine the open intervals in which it is concave up. Okay, so as soon as you see the word concave, you know that you're talking about F double prime. Okay, so as soon as you see concavity, second derivative automatically. So to get the second derivative, and we may need to find the first derivative, so that's going to be 6x squared plus 18x minus 24. So now if we go to find the second derivative, that's going to be 12x plus 18. All right, so if we set the second derivative equal to 0 and divide by 6, we get that. And if we look at our where that's equal to 0, that's uh, negative 3 halves. And so if we do some test points on there, let's do negative 5. If I put negative 5 in there and multiply that all out, that's going to be negative. And if I put in 0, that's going to be positive. So based on this, we can say that f of x is concave down uh, from negative infinity to negative 3 halves because f double prime of x is less than 0. And we can say f of x is concave up for negative 3 halves to infinity because f double prime of x is greater. So that should, look how, that's pretty simple. We should definitely get those points. Okay. Now, this one looks a little bit harder. That looks like a quotient rule. So maybe you can pause and try to do I just showed you how to do it, so pause and see if you can do that. All right, so we're going to start that quotient rule, and it almost looks like uh, maybe we could rewrite that, but that's not going to be helpful. It's only if there's a, a single term in the denominator. If this, was, if this was the reciprocal of this, then I would split that up into two and go from there. But um, So we're just going to uh, use the quotient rule. So that's going to be low. Now I tried to give you guys a way to memorize that. It starts with low and it ends with low. So low d high minus high d low over low squared. All right, so we need to simplify that out a little bit. So that's going to be 2x squared minus 8. And then over here, that's going to be minus 4x squared. So if we combine that, that's going to be negative 2x squared minus 8 over x squared minus 4 squared. So that's the first derivative. All right. Now the question is about concavity, so we need the second derivative. So now we're going to need to do the quotient rule again. This looks like it might be a little bit uh, messy, but let's see. So low d high. Minus, now I'm going to do minus high d low, but high has that, I can factor that negative out right there, so, and just put a plus there. So that's going to be 2x squared plus 8. So low d high minus high d low, but that negative will become positive. Uh, d low, that's going to be 2 times x squared minus 4. Subtract 1 from the exponent, so that would just be the first one. And then chain rule, so 2x over low squared. So that's going to take this to the fourth power. All right, now, a lot of stuff going on up there. Let's see. First of all, I see that there's basically three terms here, three groups, this, this, and this, and all of them have an x squared minus 4. So I can cancel that out, I can cancel one of those out, and I can cancel one of those out. So that's definitely what I want to do first to simplify that up a little bit. 
All right. So now I'm going to go ahead and distribute this. That's going to be negative 4x. Um, so that's going to be negative 4x cubed and then plus 16x. All right. And then here, that's going to be 4x times that. So that's going to be 8x cubed. And that's going to be uh, 4, that's going to be 32x. So if we combine this, that's going to be positive 4x cubed. And what's that, 48x? All right, so if we factor a 4x out of there, that leaves us with x squared plus... 12 over x squared minus 4 cubed. Okay, so, and we're setting that equal to 0. And the numbers that we want, remember, are where does the derivative equal 0? Where does f double prime of x equal 0? So that's going to be at 0, and then this, that's never going to be 0, because this squared is always going to be positive. So, so that's at x equals 0. Then we also want where it's not differentiable. That's going to be where the denominator is equal to 0. Where is it not differentiable? So hopefully you notice that's the difference two squares, x plus 2, x minus 2. So that's going to be x plus or minus 2. So we can come up here, and we can do a sign chart. So that's going to be negative 2, 0, 2. And we can test those intervals out. So if I plug in a negative 3, now I never have to check this because that's always positive. So if I try negative 3 in here, this will be negative. And if I try negative 3 in here, that'll be positive. So that's going to be a negative divided by a positive. That's going to be negative. Now if I try negative 1, negative 1, this is negative and this is negative. Negative divided by a negative is positive. Positive 1, this will be positive. This will be negative. That's going to be negative. And finally at 3, this is positive. This is positive. It's all positive. Now, we've only done a few of these, but uh, mostly they alternate. But they don't always alternate, so don't automatically assume that they're alternating. It has to do with the multiplicity of these numbers, um, which I probably won't talk about until we see one. So, all right, so that pretty much gets us to where we need to be. So now we can say uh, f of x is concave down from negative infinity to negative 2 and 0 to 2 because f double prime of x is less than 0. That's pretty straightforward. That's pretty nice. So the derivative part might be the hard part depending on the, what we have to do, but and they would say f of x is concave up. And that's going to be from negative 2 to 0 and from 2 to infinity because f double prime of x is greater than 0. And that's it. Okay? You have to have the because part. That's the calculus part. It's very important. All right, now. Points of inflection. If you look at these, these are the same um, equations that we already had. So if we look back at this one, points of inflection would be where we are changing signs on the derivative. So that was right here. At negative 3 halves, we change signs on the second derivative. It's the same equation function. So it does change signs, and a polynomial is defined everywhere on the polynomial. So what we do, first of all, 
is we would say we would say that we have a P P O I. So that is a possible point of inflection. We have a possible point of inflection at x equals at x equals what was it three halves at negative three halves because f double prime of x changes signs. Now a lot of students will say it changes from positive to negative or something like that. We don't really want to say that because it doesn't have to change from positive to negative. It could change from negative to positive. That doesn't really matter. It just matters that it is changing signs. So that means it's a possible point of inflection. Now the next thing to say is that f of negative 3 halves is defined. If I plug negative 3 halves into the function right there, I'll get a number. So that's uh, good. So now we can say we have a point of inflection, not a possible point, not PPOI, but just POI, point of inflection. And that point, it depends how they ask for it. If they ask for the point, you have to calculate the point. So if you plug in negative 3 halves, that turns out to be 39 and a half. I don't want to use up our time and video to, to put that out. So there you go. All right, so we'll do that again. So we have the points. Uh, this is right above there, so we can just look up. So we have possible points of inflection. Possible points of inflection at x equals negative 2, 0, and 2. But uh, because, sorry, because f double prime of x changes signs. Okay, but, okay, but f of negative 2 and f of 2 are undefined. You can't plug that back in and get y coordinates for those. So our actual point of inflection is just going to happen at 0. I guess I need to put 0. Just put 0, and then if we plug 0 in there, we get 0 divided by negative 4, which is 0. So we have an actual point of inflection at 0 over 0. Okay. So when we have a graph like this, so first of all, this says this is a graph of f prime. This is a graph of a derivative. And it says, find all the intervals on which f is concave down. Okay, so we're in that middle level. The function is above this, the second derivative is below it, and we're asking a question about the second derivative because that tells us about the function. The function is concave down when the second derivative is negative. So I need to know when the second derivative is negative. So first of all, let's look. This is f prime. So let's look at that. Sometimes I'll make a little chart underneath here. So f prime, if we look at it, is negative. Let me make a little sign chart across here. Up to here, it's negative. And then from there to there, it's positive. And then from there to there, it's negative. And then past that, it's positive. That's the first derivative. Okay, and we may or may not need that uh, for anything, but um, now let's look at the second derivative. So the second derivative, okay, so if, the, if this, so let's, this function is increasing until we get to b. So at b, so this is increasing, so this is the derivative. If the derivative is increasing, its derivative has to be positive, right? A positive derivative means a function's increasing. So this would be positive. Then it's decreasing all the way over here to d. So that because this function, don't confuse it with the original. I'm just comparing these two right now. So this, this function's decreasing, so its derivative is negative. And then this function is increasing, so its derivative is positive. So based on that, Okay, and what did we just say? We said 
um, when f prime is decreasing, then that means that f double prime is less than zero. And when we want to know if something's concave down, we want to know when its second derivative is less than zero. So that's how those things all connect. And that's happening from b to d. Okay? So um, f is concave down from b to d because f double prime of x is less than zero. All right. So f has points of inflection where its second derivative changes signs. So that's going to be possible points of inflection at x, and it says values of x, uh, when the second derivative changes sign. So that's happening at b and d, b and d, because f double prime of x changes signs. Okay, now if the derivative exists at those points, that means the function has to be, right? Because to have a derivative, you have to be continuous. So that means it would have to be defined. So that means that these are actual points of inflection also. Okay, so now we're comparing these two things. So they're asking us, true or false, is f prime of c less than f prime of double c? So first of all, there's a graph of f prime, so that's easy. f prime of c, that's zero. Okay, now f double prime of c, we just made a sign chart for that. At c, f double prime, this is decreasing, that means its derivative is negative. So f double prime at c is negative. Is zero less than a negative number? No, so that's false. Okay. So there's several questions on this about whether it's a positive, negative, or zero, and that's how you're going to compare the values. Okay. Now we have the second derivative test. So if you recall, if a function has its first derivative equal to zero, that tells us that we have extrema there. And if you have the second derivative is greater than zero, that means it's concave up. I have a lot of students miss this on the test, and I never have understood why. If your first derivative is zero, and if your second derivative is positive, think about what that means. If the second derivative is positive, that means it's concave up. If your first derivative is zero, that means you have a maximum or a minimum. If something is concave up, and it has an extrema, the extrema it has has to be a minimum. Similarly, if the second derivative is negative, that means it's concave down. If something is concave down, and it has to have a minimum or a maximum, then it has to have a maximum. So I don't know why people get this wrong on tests. Um, not enough details, or they think it's so easy they don't study it. I don't know. But uh, if f double prime equals 0, then you can't use the for, uh, second derivative test. You have to use the first derivative test. The problem is that on the AP test, sometimes they give you something that you can't use the first derivative test. So in the first year or two that I taught this, I was like, oh, who cares about the second derivative test? Just use the first derivative test. But then I saw in an AP test, they got a little tricky. And we'll take a look at that in a moment. But let's do this first. So use the second derivative test. So to use the second derivative test, we need a second derivative. So we're going to take the first derivative. This looks pretty familiar. Looks like something we've done before. And so, um, 
keep going. So the second derivative test, that's going to be 12x plus 18. Now, what are we going to do here? Well, we want to, we want to know when the derivative equals 0. So if we set that equal to 0 and divide by 6, maybe you remember that's x squared uh, plus 3x minus 4. So that's going to be x uh, plus 4 and x minus 1. So that's going to give us x equals negative 4 and 1. Now, let's pretend that we didn't have the original function, that we just had the derivative, and we could find the zeros. Since we didn't have the original function, that could cause us some problems. So what we could do is we can test to see what's going on. So we know that we have a minimum or maximum at these two points. All right, so we know that we have an extrema at negative 4 and at 1. We just don't know if it's a minimum or a maximum. So what we do is we plug the value into the second derivative. So we're just calculating. And we don't actually even have to calculate the whole number. We just need to know is it positive or negative. So the point here is that that's going to be negative 40. That's going to be negative 30. I don't care it's negative 30. I know that it's going to be negative, though. So since I know that the second derivative is negative, I know it's concave down. So on a test, I want to see this. I want to see that you know that it's negative or positive, and then that you put concave down. So now we know that because it's concave down, we have a maximum. So we have a relative maximum at... Um, now, it didn't really say what we were doing here, so instead of saying at, I'm going to give the coordinates of both points. So that's, the directions weren't totally clear. That's not whiting out very well. Um, and so I know that the x-coordinate's negative 4. And when you want to find the y-coordinate, you need to plug it back in the original. And if you plug it back in the original, you're going to get 102. So we have a relative maximum there. Now we're going to test 1. So we're going to plug 1 into the second derivative. So if you plug 1 in there, you can pretty much see that's going to be 12 plus 18, and that is positive. So that means that it's concave up. And since it's concave up, you can see that that's a minimum. So that means we have a relative minimum and that was at 1, and if you plug 1 back in there, you can calculate that. That's going to be negative 23. All right? And that's all the second derivative test is. The second derivative test is really nice. Now, because we had the whole function, we could have used the first derivative test, and I could have made a sign chart over here. So the first derivative test, We would have done a sign chart, and we would have seen where is it changing from positive to negative, etc. Okay? All right, so we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to use the second derivative test. So we're going to take the first derivative. That's going to be 15x to the fourth minus uh, 15x squared. And if we set that equal to 0 and we factor out a 15x squared, that would leave us with x squared here, and then minus 1. So x squared minus, eh, I was going to skip a step, but I guess I won't, x squared minus 1. So that's going to be 15x squared, x plus 1, x minus 1. So we know those values are going to be negative 1, 0, and 1. Now, we would never use, probably, I don't think we would use the 